I want to say welcome. My name is Minister Kimberly Strother, and I'm the current president of the Springfield Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. We're a sisterhood of predominantly Black college-educated women dedicated to scholarship and public service. DST was founded on the campus of Howard University in Washington, D.C. by 22 students in 1913. The Springfield Alumni Chapter was chartered on December 5th in 1981 by 14 Delta women who are determined and committed to service in the neighborhoods of the greater Springfield, Massachusetts area. With the pandemic at the forefront in everyone's mind, a lot of disinformation was being circulated. We as an organization could not stand by while our community was at risk. We were determined to do what we could to help our beloved community. So this afternoon's con Crimson Conversation on COVID-19 vaccine and what inquiring minds want to know is sponsored by the Springfield Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority and Bay State Health. This event is brought to you by a collaboration between our Social Action Committee, co-chaired by SOAR's Brenda Harvey and Dora Robinson, and the Health Task Force Committee, co-chaired by SOAR's Tamara Crenshaw and Kara Woolridge. Another portion of our collaboration with Bay State Health is the creation of 200 SAC Code Red Care 19 kits which will be distributed in the greater Springfield area. So we want to just say thank you. We really appreciate the collaboration with Bay State. And we just want to let you know that one will be raffled at the end of this program, along with some other things. So now I have the pleasure of introducing the moderator, Sora Kara Woolridge. Thank you so much. Um, it's such a pleasure to see everyone here this evening um, on the Crimson Conversations, tackling a very, very important topic. Um, the purpose of this conversation is to provide you, the viewers, with pertinent information about COVID-19 vaccines and the implications for African-American communities, and to empower you to make an informed and independent decision about being vaccinated. So um, without further ado, I would like to introduce our, our guest, Dr. Mark Kerouac, and give you a little bio uh, before he speaks. So Dr. Mark Kerouac is a Springfield native, and he is married to Dr. Ann Erichetti. I hope I said that right. <laughs> um, and together they have two daughters. Dr. Kerouac is a graduate of Amherst College and Harvard Medical School and received his master's in public health from Boston University. He's trained in internal medicine and infectious disease at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston. And Dr. Kerouac has held many roles throughout his career. One of those roles includes 12 years as a part of the UMass faculty, where he focused on HIV and AIDS as a part, um, excuse me. And as a part of the UMass faculty, he was able to win five annual teaching awards. Impressive. In 1995, he served as the president of the 700 Physician UMass Memorial Group and the vice president of medical management for UMass Memorial Healthcare. Before coming back to Springfield and working at Bay State, he was the senior vice president and chief medical officer at the University Health System Consortium in Oak Brook, Illinois. In 2011 to 2013, Dr. Kerouac served as Bay State Health's chief physician executive and president of Bay State Health Medical Practices in 2013 and 2014. He became the chief operating officer for Bay State Health System. He is currently the president and chief executive officer of Bay State Health, board of directors for Health New England, president of the Bay State Health Foundation and professor of medicine at UMass Medical School. In addition to all of that, he currently serves on many local boards focusing on and improving the quality of life for residents in his native Springfield and Western Massachusetts. Thank you so much, Dr. Carrack, for being here with us today. It is an honor and just taking your time out on this Sunday to share this information with us. Well, thanks so much, Kara. I want to add one little line to, to the bio, and that is that your dad was the chairman of the board that hired me. Uh, into the, the the role of CEO back in 2014. 
I think I've never been so shocked in my life when he uh, pitched the idea to me. <laughs> <laughs> I've definitely heard this story before. Uh... I'll bet. Uh, well, I wanted to, first of all, thank the Deltas for inviting me. I've been very impressed to learn about all you're doing to provide the residents of Springfield with what they need to keep them safe, as well as the knowledge. I was also impressed to hear that one of your own, Dr. Shirley Jackson Whitaker, has actually written a book that's now being published uh, to help educate the public about what COVID means and how to protect yourself. I was going to give you maybe five minutes of where we are today uh, with this infection and with the vaccine, and then just open it up to questions. I know Kara has a number that she's collected from the membership, and I guess we would either take questions either in the chat room or you can just speak up or raise your hand. Uh, in terms of where we're at today, uh, it's an amazing thing that we're coming up on the one-year anniversary. Bay State saw its first COVID case on March the 15th, and as a country, we've gone from one case back in mid-February to uh, 500,000 deaths, 27 million cases now. And I think nobody anymore is questioning whether or not this is a serious disease. Even so, about a third of the people who get infected never have any symptoms at all, and they can still pass it on to other people, which is why this has been such a tough disease to contain. About two thirds of people will get sick and they usually get a pretty bad flu for a week or two. They'll get fevers and chills, they'll wanna stay in bed, they'll have a cough, maybe a little shortness of breath. Very rarely some unusual symptoms will occur. People will lose their sense of smell, for example. Uh, the virus may even affect the heart muscle. Eduardo Rodriguez, a pitcher for the Red Sox, missed the 2020 season because his heart got infected with COVID. And we're learning more that people may get really long symptoms that go on for weeks or months with fatigue, so-called brain fog, uh, and just not feeling themselves and not returning to their normal activities for months and months. And this can even happen in younger people. So I think this is a disease that everybody wants to try to avoid and protect themselves against. About 20% of the people who get sick are sick enough to come to the hospital and a fraction of a percent of the people who get infected, 0.3%, actually end up dying. This is way down from where it used to be uh, where, because of some new treatments. We know that the disease is worse in older individuals, as well as people with chronic diseases like diabetes or high blood pressure or obesity. While the majority of infections and deaths have occurred in older individuals who are more likely to be white, when you correct for age, when you look for people in a certain age category, it's very clear that African-Americans have been hit harder by this infection. They're roughly three times more likely to be infected and two times more likely to die if they get infected uh, compared to the general population. And this is not due to genetics. Uh, as you know, we all share the same genes. 99.5% of our DNA is the same. But for people in the African-American community, they're much less likely to be working in a job where they can either work from home or else have paid sick leave. And therefore, they're more likely to be exposed to the general public as part of their work. They may also live in either crowded or multi-generational housing, uh, which also would increase their risk for catching the disease. And then they'd be more likely also to have some of these chronic diseases, such as diabetes, high blood pressure, and obesity. We know here in Springfield that as a result of those chronic diseases, the African-American population in some neighborhoods of the city has a lower life expectancy compared to uh, those in the suburbs by almost 10 years, which is a real indictment of the healthcare disparities that exist uh, in our country. The good news about this uh, virus is that we now have two very good vaccines and are likely to have a third in a week or two. They're very effective. They're safe. Uh, and still, though, there are about 50% of people in some surveys who say they just don't trust it. They just are not sure about getting this vaccine. Uh, coupled with that, the, the rollout here in Massachusetts has been pretty bumpy, to say the least. Uh, we've given out about 1.7 million shots, uh, and uh, about a million people have gotten a first dose for, through the various state programs. Another 300,000 or so have gotten shots through a federal program for, for nursing homes. But because the state 
really wanted to start going fast and not be uh, sort of at the bottom of the heap in terms of the percentage of the vaccine they administered, they've been focused focused on mass vaccination sites. And there's been a disparity there as well. Uh, of the people who have gotten the vaccine so far, 66% have been white, only 5% black, 4% Latino, and uh, unknown racial or ethnic category in 18%. At Bay State, we have stood up uh, our own vaccine center up in Holyoke that can do, on most days, about 800 shots a day, occasionally over 1,000. We take 15% uh, of our allocation and uh, ship it down to our health centers and have had pop-up clinics there, as well as up to Franklin County, where uh, there have been shortages as well. Uh, we've learned how we've learned a lot about dealing with vaccine hesitancy from our own employees. We have 12,000 employees at Bay State, and we vaccinated 10,000 of them. 25% of our employees are people of color, either uh, black or, or Latino, and 25% of the people we vaccinated are also people of color. That didn't happen by accident. We've actually had to actively work to through social media campaigns, through various trusted voices, as well as various health fairs and question answering sessions, uh, because we find that many people who are hesitant simply want to learn more about the side effects and how this vaccine was developed. So I'm hopeful we can touch on some of those issues today. And uh, Kara, I'll hand it back to you now. Yes, thank you. So yeah, what we'll do is I'll ask you a few questions and we'll leave ample time at the end for chats to be filtered, um, excuse me, questions to be filtered through the chat. Um, and you, thank you, first of all, from on behalf of the community for the work that Bay State Health is doing and making efforts to vaccinate people. Um, you know, you made a really good point and Kimberly made a, a mention of this earlier that there's a lot of misinformation going around and it's mainly because people don't have the right information about the COVID vaccines and the science behind it, really just understanding the science behind it. Um, so let's look into that. Um, you know, it's significant. There's a significant impact on African American communities, as you've just described. And it's, we need to explore more about the vaccine's development. Some people might be undecided about making or taking the vaccine, and it has been so politicized and people have a lot of distrust as it has been developed under the previous administration. Um, this has by far been the fastest pharmaceutical companies and researchers have developed the vaccine. So can you please explain how this was possible and why these vaccines are considered safe? Yes, the two vaccines that are out there now, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines, are using a brand new kind of technology that's never been used before in vaccines. To give you a sense of how we do a, a usual vaccine, the flu vaccine, what we will do is grow up a batch of virus, we'll neutralize it, uh, and it, it's very laborious. They use embryonated chick eggs, believe it or not. It takes weeks and weeks to grow this up. And then they basically will kill it off using chemicals. And they try to match the virus to whatever was circulating around the previous year. It's fairly crude. It's pretty old fashioned. The technology hasn't changed in years and years. This particular uh, va vaccine, the COVID vaccine, uses something called messenger RNA or mRNA. And if you remember from your basic biology, DNA is what codes our genes, and the way you turn DNA into a protein uh, is through this messenger RNA. It basically gives a message from the gene to the protein-making apparatus. There was a scientific discovery, oh, about 10 years ago, whereby people could construct messenger RNA, inject it into cells, have it taken up by the cells, and the cells would be fooled into making some kind of a foreign protein. And uh, this was uh, really quite a breakthrough at the time. And it means that instead of growing up virus in big batches, you can simply construct the messenger RNA from the various genetic code in the laboratory. The actual construction of these viruses only took a few weeks, believe it or not. And what took months and months was the testing to decide how much you could give a person safely. Was it effective? Did it make antibodies? And what was it safe? So this particular little chemical, this messenger RNA, fools the body into making the so-called spike protein of the COVID virus, 
And then the body will make an antibody to this foreign protein, and the person is then immune. And I mean, not just a little immune, 95% protection. Right. And messenger RNA, this science has been around for some while. I know when we spoke, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned Caitlin, uh, let's see, Caitlin Carrico. Yes, a Hungarian scientist. And she came here uh, in the 80s and then worked at UPenn in the 90s. So this science has been around. It's just now being applied to vaccinations. Is that correct? Yeah, she was not terribly well appreciated in terms of her discoveries. I think partly because she had a thick accent and partly because she was a woman, uh, this idea of modifying messenger RNA so that it could say, so it could be taken up into cells and not immediately destroyed by the body was something that was thought to be a little bit crazy. And so she was not funded by the NIH or anybody and continued to work kind of in obscurity for many years. And now she's really become quite a hero. I, I would predict that she's likely to win the Nobel Prize for this uh, when all is said and done. It's quite a breakthrough. Absolutely. Um, can you please explain the emergency FDA authorization to distribute and administer the uh, vaccines? And does this invalidate the efficacy of the vaccine, the, the timeline that it has been given? The emergency use authorization or EUA is a kind of fast track process that the FDA uses, but it doesn't mean it's a shortcut. What all va vaccines go through, and they're tested more thoroughly than most medications because you're giving them to healthy people, is there's a phase one stage where they'll give the uh, dose, differing doses to a few dozen people to see how much is too much, how much is too little. There's then a phase two uh, part where they might give it to 100 or so people to see if it indeed does what it's supposed to, that is to say, cause an antibody. And then the big trials are the phase three trials. And both the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines have been in trials of between 30 and 40,000 volunteers. Half of the volunteers got the vaccine, the experimental vaccine, and half of them got uh, just a salt and water injection that wouldn't do anything. And the FDA was keeping very close track of this and insisted that there be significant representation of various subgroups. So three to 5,000 African-Americans, for example, enough people who were elderly and who had these uh, chronic conditions. And when they finally found how amazingly effective it was, as I say, 95% protective, what they decided was that instead of simply watching the group that had gotten the vaccine for another year to see if there are any delayed side effects. It was such an urgent thing to get it out there uh, that they decided to stop the trial short. And even though the president, the former president, was putting a lot of pressure on the FDA to um, conclude the trials quickly and have the vaccine out there before the election, the assembled scientists of the evaluation group basically locked arms and said, no, we're not going to do this until it's ready, until we see all the data. Okay. And he actually threatened to fire the head of the FDA over this. And, the, and you know, to his credit, he, stu he stuck to his guns. Yeah, we need more people like that sticking to their guns. <laughs> You know, as you were talking, you mentioned um, African-American research subjects. We know historically it's a little difficult to get African-Americans to participate in medical clinical trials due to historical events that we know have happened between the two communities. Um, so would you say to your knowledge, this is also true for research subjects in the COVID-19? Was it difficult to get African-Americans to participate or, or not? Yeah. It was. As a matter of fact, when Moderna first came forward with its, um, with its data, the uh, review group, these independent scientific review groups said, we're sorry, you don't have enough African-Americans and Latinos in your group. You have to go out and recruit some more. And until you show us that you have significant numbers there, we're not going to give you a widespread approval for this. So yes, it was tough. The third vaccine that's about to come out uh, is Johnson & Johnson. That one has been tested across the world. And so they've actually tested it in Africa, in South Africa, where this so-called variant is, and in Latin America. Uh, and so the number of the, it's only a minority of the test subjects that were in the United States, but both Pfizer and Moderna were mostly tested in the U.S.
You know, it's interesting you mentioned the Johnson and Johnson because when you look at the research, it only ha it has a significantly lower efficacy rate, but it it had to factor in the South African variant. Um, do you think Pfizer and Moderna will also be effective against the South African variant? Well, they've actually tested it for people who developed an antibody to the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. They were able to test it in the laboratory against this variant and found that it still neutralized the virus that has prevented it from causing an infection in a laboratory. So they're feeling pretty confident that uh, that's going to work. Mm -hmm. uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine was somewhat less effective. Uh, it was probably in the, in, in the range of how effective a, a flu shot is in a good flu shot year. But the protect the, so the overall protection from Johnson and Johnson was sixty six percent. However, the protection against serious disease that is something that would land you in the ICU or might kill you uh, was eighty five percent plus. And so it still felt to be a really good vaccine. Plus, it's a one and done. So if people are squeamish about getting that second shot, or else that you know, let's say they lived in some remote area and they might be hard to get to. Uh, the one the one shot deal might be a, a good option for them. Absolutely. I know Johnson and Johnson doesn't have to be uh, stored under those strict constrictions and it can be offered to people in remote locations. So that's really good to know. Um, as we think about how the virus continues to mutate, do you anticipate the use of booster shots or annual vaccinations like the flu shot? Well, this is a, a virus that uses RNA and not DNA as its genetic material. And it's so, so it's kind of messy when it tries to make copies of itself. It makes mistakes on a regular basis. Most of these mistakes are not viable, but every once in a while, you get billions and billions of viruses, you're going to get one that uh, behaves a little differently. They've, there have been about a half a dozen or so that have been isolated in the, in the United States so far. One, such as the British variant, is more transmissible but it's no worse in terms of the seriousness of the infection and the vaccines work well against it. The South African one might be somewhat resistant to one of the vaccines we haven't mentioned, but it seems to be susceptible to the others. This virus, even though it changes its stripes or throws out these variants, uh, is, doesn't do so as dramatically or as frequently as flu. So I'd be surprised if we wound up having to get a booster every year, but maybe every three to five or something like that. We'll, we'll have to see how it all shakes out. But uh, this, this virus does not change quite as rapidly as flu, thank God. Thank goodness. As we consider getting the vaccination. I got vaccinated. I work at Bay State Health. I know I'm young, but I work at Bay State Health, so I got it. Um, as we consider getting the vaccination, what are some of the signs and symptoms they might experience after their first or second shot? Yeah, I got it too. And I, I think we've compared notes and um, I might have actually gotten a worse reaction than you did. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I, I don't know how that happened because it's supposed to be worse in young people. In any event, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people, a majority of people will get a sore arm. And I got a sore arm for a day or two. And it was like somebody punched me in the arm. It was like a, like a tetanus booster, uh, let's say. And then with the second shot, I got that so-called mini flu where for about six or eight hours, I had uh, some chills and aches and felt tired and, you know, kind of took a nap and slept it off. And then I was better. Uh, it, that happens about a quarter of the time with people, more likely with the second dose than with the first, and at least according to the literature, uh, more likely in younger people than older people. I like I say to my wife that proves I'm young at heart that uh, I had this bad reaction. Absolutely. Um, what about allergies? Individuals with allergies, there might be some concerns around that. Would it? What would yep. you there are occasional allergies to some of the chemicals that are used to stabilize the mRNA in the vaccine. And that's why people have to sit for 20 minutes after they get the shot to see if they get hives or itching or, you know, breathing problems or whatever. We've given out now uh, close to 30,000 doses of the vaccine, and we've seen 10 reactions, uh, and they've been able to be treated with um, the sorts of things that people who are allergic to bee stings carry, the injected epinephrine or EpiPens that uh, people with serious like peanut allergies or bee sting allergies will get. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's why you need to actually get this in a place where 
you've got medical personnel who can respond to the rare allergic reaction. So you're talking, you know, less than one in a thousand, maybe one in 10,000 uh, in terms of these really unusual reactions. Okay. For, for those who are worried or consider, you know, not having foreign things put in them, is this vaccine, uh, for lack of a better word, organic, not really chemically based, but organic in nature? Uh, yeah, I know that there are, I know in some individuals, their religious beliefs will pre prevent them from getting something from another animal. Uh, I have not seen what the religious leaders of some of the sects are saying about this. Mm -hmm. At least from my standpoint, it's something that's synthesized in a laboratory, like out of powdered chemicals, as opposed to uh, isolated from an animal uh, or, you know, grown in a chick egg or, you know, containing real virus. This is a, an artificial chemical uh, where they simply read off the genetic code that was determined from the COVID virus and put, you know, like beads on a string. They lined up all these chemicals so that they formed an mRNA. Now, uh, obviously, I have, I've not spoken with some of the religious leaders who might have concerns about this, but I do believe it's in a different category in terms of the kinds of things uh, that we use for vaccines usually. Absolutely. So we all know you have a passion to improve the quality of life of residents in the greater Springfield area in Western Mass. And you previously mentioned the different local sites for vaccination. Who is currently eligible to get vaccinated? I think you might have alluded to this earlier. Um, who's eligible? And then again, where can they be vaccinated? Yeah, they just changed the or, or broadened the rules yesterday. Or I'm sorry, last week. They went from anybody over 75. It's now anybody over 65 or anybody with a couple or more of a chronic medical condition, like the ones I mentioned, diabetes, high blood pressure. It includes things like heart disease and cancer. There's a full list on mass.gov. And then the third group would be people who live in either public housing or assisted senior housing. Uh, we know that sort of crowded or you know congregate living situations will increase the transmission of the virus. And the demand for the vaccine has really exceeded its supply. I mean, we have really worried that having our little site up in Holyoke there was going to bias us toward people who had access to transportation and knew how to use the internet, which is why we're giving about 15% of our weekly supply to our three health centers in Springfield and actually contacting the patients uh, to tell them to come in and get vaccinated. But I do think that we need more in the way of sites that are open to the public in Springfield. Mm -hmm. And it's something that um, I've talked to Secretary Sutters about as well. Uh, as you know, they were interested in, uh, what shall I say, reducing the amount of vaccine going to the hospitals and the hospital systems. And I think we were able to argue very forcefully that if you really want to get it into the arms of people who are vulnerable, uh, then you're not going to do that by having asking everybody to go to the mall uh, to get it. And so they were persuaded by that. And I think they shifted gears. They've also opened it up uh, to the patients of the uh, federally qualified health centers like Caring Health, as well as Holyoke, the Holyoke Health Center. We are in partnership, as you may know, with, Holyoke, with uh, the Caring Health Center around the care of 45,000 uh, Medicaid uh, uh, insured residents of Springfield. So there are plenty of people uh, from those high risk groups that we can get busy vaccinating, even without having them have to go through the registration site. So we're going to shift. I see a couple of questions coming through. So I'm going to shift to the chat and I'm going to ask those questions. Uh, it looks like the... No, it looks like Dora Robinson's question was first, and it says, is Bay State working clo closely with the Springfield Health Department to locate vaccine centers in communities, neighborhoods with a significant population of black and brown people? And I think you started to touch on that as you were just explaining um, that you were trying to get them in community centers and locate those patients. Yeah, well, I would say not yet, Dora. I mean, we've worked together with Commissioner Carlton Harris around testing. Uh, in vulnerable populations. And I've become aware of a very interesting cooperation out in Berkshire County between the health system there and their local boards of health. 
And I actually was texting with Secretary Sutters last week that and asking her if we were to set something like that up here in Springfield, would you be supportive? And so uh, Commissioner Carlton Harris and I need to talk some more about that because I think as more vaccine becomes available, uh, we're going to want to not only focus on our own health centers, but also have something that's open to the public and easy to get to. Absolutely. Cora Butler-Jones asks, are there any nosocomial implications? For uh, COVID-19 or for the vaccination? I have, well, well I, I, let me ask, answer the both. In terms of uh, getting, getting COVID-19, uh, you certainly can, once you're in the hospital and your lungs have been injured by this virus, you can get secondary or so-called nosocomial infections uh, with bacteria or any of a number of bad things. And often that is what, what happens in people who die. Uh, I'm not aware of anybody from the vaccine trials that, that needed to be put, uh, admitted to the hospital to take care of their side effects or their problems. And so as vaccines go, while nearly everybody will get some mild side effect like a sore arm, uh, the seriousness of the side effects are, is not such that it would require somebody to be in the hospital. Thank you. Uh, Valley Brian Cotto asks, since Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are made on an mRNA platform and they're replicating opposed to Johnson & Johnson, which is non-replicating, is there any chance that the mRNA and the spike protein replication won't turn off and become a cancer cell? Or is there an apoptosis self-destruct mechanism built in the body which makes enough spike proteins? Uh, it's a great question. I think that in terms of the long-term effects of these vaccines, uh, given that they're an unusual chemical composition, the short answer is people don't know if a year, two years, three years from now, uh, these uh, mRNA uh, vaccines can cause problems. We do know that the mRNA uh, is not enough to create an entire virus. But we also know that it is such that it can't integrate into uh, the cellular DNA. And so uh, the evidence is that it is ultimately destroyed. When plain natural mRNA is injected to the body, into the body, it's destroyed almost instantaneously. This has been chemically modified so that it lasts a bit longer, but it is ultimately destroyed. Salonia Jordan, my daughter is 17. I assume when it is her turn that they will be able to distinguish which one is she eligible to take because my understanding, one of the shots, she must be 18 and older. Is that true? I, I think the Pfizer, you can be 16. Is that true? You know, I, I, I'm not sure which one switched, but I know one of them they tested 16 and older and the other they tested 18 and older. And so, yes, one of those two she would qualify for, and I'm just not sure which one. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, Shirley Whitaker, patient was COVID positive, told to wait 90 days to get the vaccine. He wants to take his two single shot now. Should he wait after he gets the COVID vaccine? He, he should. I think that the, the, the overwhelming evidence is that people who were symptomatic from their COVID infection, they've got the flu thing or ended up in the hospital, have really good immune reactions uh, that last at least six months, probably more. And so my own feeling on these things is sure, he could wait 90 days, he could probably wait 180 days and still be fully protected. I think the worry I would have is that uh, if his immune system is already primed and ready, ready to go, uh, against the COVID vaccine, he could get a real serious reaction, you know, a, a really bad flu kind of reaction. And so I do think you need to wait and sort of let it cool down a bit. Uh, ne the next question is pretty similar. Danielle Cade, I was COVID positive back in December. I received my first shot. Um, excuse me. I received my first shot last week within my 90 day window. Will the vaccine be as effective if I waited another 90 days? I think that uh, the immune system will be primed by that secondary challenge by giving that extra, you know, uh, mRNA and, and having that extra challenge with the spike protein. And, you know, in terms of how long lasting the immunity is, not enough time has gone by for us to answer most of those questions. I noticed, by the way, that Valerie Brancato, who's obviously done her homework, 
uh, just offered up that it is the Pfizer uh, that tested in the 16-year-old group. So that's the one that uh, the 17-year-old needs to get. Yeah. Uh, let's see, Reverly, Reverend Beverly, since African-Americans are at a higher risk for COVID-19, how do we know that vaccines address conditions that are caused our increased risk? Well, the, uh, the key thing is the uh, number of individuals who were uh, included in the trials. Let me get this right. here. In the Pfizer trial, there were 43,000 people, 3,400 were African-American, 10,000 were Hispanic. In the Moderna trial, uh, again, over 3,000 African-Americans out of 30,000 volunteers, 6,200 Hispanics. And so that's a significant number. Uh, so assuming they were representative of the general population, uh, you could, I think they felt very comfortable looking at the the effectiveness statistics in that subgroup, there were enough of them that they could draw conclusions from that. Mary Worthy is asking, is monoclonal antibody treatment one of Trump's treatments available to persons regardless of their ability to pay or ability to afford? Well, we provide medical care without regard to anyone's ability to pay. And we are uh, providing monoclonal antibody to anyone infected with COVID-19. So the answer to that would be yes at Bay State. I would say one of the things that they'll ask you if you register for an appointment is, did you get monoclonal antibody? Because if you have gotten monoclonal antibody, they are going to ask you to wait on the vaccine as well, because presumably you got it because you had a real live infection and are going to have your own immunity for a while. Tamara Dodds asks, are swollen lymph nodes normal after receiving the first and or second shot? They are not normal, but they are occasionally observed. Uh, I've seen a couple of case reports where people had painful enlargement of the lymph nodes that then settled down after a few weeks time. It's a pretty rare uh, event. And let's see. Mabel Sharif, I'm 76 years young. I know that's right. I too have had both shots. I experienced no symptoms after my first vaccine. 12 hours after my second vaccine, I experienced chills, mild lower back pain, mild headache right behind my left ear, left shoulder pain, body stiffness, small temperature of 98.7, joint pain, tiredness that only lasted 24 hours. I don't usually have headaches or any other pain on a daily basis. Would you say that was a typical reaction from a vaccination? Well, first, Mabel, I'm so happy that you're protected. Mabel is the chair of our Basin Square uh, uh, Health Task Force. Uh, so that's great news. Uh, not that you got the side effects, but, but yeah, and the side effects are typical for what one sees, maybe a bit more uh, severe in your case than average, uh, but they certainly are pretty much uh, in the kind of things that we hear from people, uh, it, that they're kind of down for the count for a day or so. We often are advising people to maybe think about a day off or to get, you know, if you have the option to, to take a day off after you get your second shot in particular. Valerie, Valerie Brancato again, do you have any updates on the U.S. variants, namely California, Ohio, and Midwestern variants? There are a number of variants that are just being isolated and just being studied. Uh, the one that I think is most serious in Massachusetts is the British variant, 1.1.1.7, um, Valerie, I'm sure you've read about it. Uh, this is the one that seems to cause the same kind of disease as the original strain. It is as responsive or it's defeated by the monoclonal antibody in the vaccine. However, it's more contagious. And so just by competition, it seems to be uh, edging out the original strain. In Great Britain, where this all started out, it took about six months for this virus to kind of, for this strain to edge out the original strain. And many people think that's going to happen here. Uh, by the end of the spring. Many of these other strains uh, are very rarely and occasionally seen. There's one from Brazil, one from South Africa, and uh, people are keeping a real close eye on the South African strain because one of the vaccines, the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is further back in terms of its development, 
uh, seem to be less effective against uh, that particular variant when you're talking about younger people with mild disease. Mm. Don Leakes asks, if I'm understanding correctly, the mRNA should be destroyed because it's been chemically treated and because it came to market so quickly, we're not sure that the vaccine will cause other health issues for those that take it in a few years. Is this correct? Uh, the second part is correct. That is to say, the FDA, if they were going to do their usual uh, approval process, would have said, okay, we know that this vaccine is effective. Um, and now we're just going to sit back and we're going to watch what happens to these people who have gotten it for a year or two before we release it. I personally think that would have been irresponsible because, you know, the because COVID would have killed a lot of people in the meantime. And so I think this emergency use authorization is not the same thing as saying the FDA has approved it. They have studied it. They've studied its its safety in the short run. They've studied its effectiveness. But, you know, this is stuff that just was happening last year. And so nobody can tell you if there's a side effect that's going to come about, you know, three years, five years from now. Uh, the risk benefit balance favored putting the vaccine out there. Uh, but I think, you know, we all ought to have our eyes wide open that that is the truth, that that's that we basically don't have the usual long term study that we would have had for uh, say a whooping cough vaccine or a measles vaccine or something like that. And uh, the, the destruction of the mRNA is something that's been documented. Uh, we have Nicole Fox Cole, how many people have to be vaccinated for us to experience herd, herd immunity that has been floating around? What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's a it's a tricky issue, and I think that we're probably going to get there sooner than people think. Yeah, and here's why: in addition to, I think there have been like forty million people who have been vaccinated. There have been close to thirty million uh, infections, actual infections, from which people are immune, and people assume that that might be a three or a full fourfold underestimate, and that there are a lot of people who might just get a little fever and not bother going to the doctor, not bother testing. And so there may well be more than 100 million people in, in the United States today that um, are able to defend themselves against COVID. Uh, that's you know roughly a third of the population. As the infection continues to spread and as vaccines continue to advance, I think we, we are going to be in a pretty good place uh, come June or July. Ideally, you'd like to have 70, 80% of the population immune, either because of vaccine or because of infection. Uh, but I think that we're underestimating the number of people out there who have antibody because of mild infection that never got diagnosed. Mm -hmm. Teresa Bryant asks, what would be the risk to an adult with multiple health issues who is vaccinated being exposed daily to children not required to wear masks? Excuse me, not required to wear a mask gets exposed. So this might be like a daycare setting, et cetera. There are uh, complicated uh, but fairly solid data about how to reopen either childcare centers or um, elementary schools. Those were just published by the CDC last week. They do uh, suggest the wearing of masks, uh, a little less social distancing, three feet instead of the six. Uh, and many large cities, including New York City and Providence, Rhode Island, have been able to safely reopen elementary schools, even though there's a fair amount of COVID in the community. What we know about small children is that they get infected less frequently with the, with the virus. And when they do, they don't shed it as much or for as long. And so I think that if indeed, if you have been vaccinated and you're also using the kind of precautions that have, are recommended, uh, that you could be safely in, uh, in the presence of those younger kids. Mm -hmm. Willette Johnson asks, when will people be allowed to visit family and friends who may be hospitalized now that so many people are being vaccinated? Yeah, we take a look at the uh, test positivity and the amount of virus in 
the community before we make a decision. There are red, green, and yellow um, criteria that are used by the Department of Public Health in telling the hospitals that they can open up or not. So for example, uh, the Bay State Franklin Medical Center in Greenfield, because the, va- the virus rates are so low in that community, we're now allowing visitors. Uh, we can't yet do that in Springfield, but I'm hopeful that in another few weeks or so, if things continue on their current trajectory, we may be able to do so. But it really depends mostly on how many new cases are we seeing in the community and how often are tests coming back positive and not so much about uh, how, how many people are getting vaccinated. Oh, let's see. We have River Rose. It's a lovely name. River Rose asks, what are numbers for Africa since we are at risk? And what are the numbers in terms of deaths after taking the vaccine based on Moderna Advisors FDA briefing document, clinical trial submitted for emergency use? So let me ask, answer the second one first. Uh, the, both of the vaccines were 100% effective against COVID-related death or uh, or severe illness, that is to say COVID landing you in the ICU. So uh, the likelihood that you are going to die from COVID if you've gotten your second shot are incredibly small, you know, less than one in 10,000 or one in 100,000. So you never say never in biology, but it's extremely, extremely unlikely. And I'm not sure I understood the question about Africa. Are we talking about disease spread in Africa? I'm not sure. I'm going to invite River Rose to um, clarify that in the chat and we'll come back to you. Let me just say one thing. There is an important piece about this whole vaccine. I mean, we've talked about disparities in vaccine administration within our own country. But if you look at the difference between rich countries and poor countries, it's quite scary. I think of the, you know, tens of millions of doses of vaccine that have been given across the world, less than 1 million have been given in African countries. And uh, it's really, uh, it's, it's a real problem because the more you allow virus to spread unchecked, no matter what country it's in, the more likely you're going to be dealing with these troublesome variants. So we really need a global vaccine strategy. Uh, and I'm glad to see that some of these one-shot vaccines like Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca are coming out that don't require all this fancy refrigeration because mm-hmm. that is something that would be much more amenable to an underdeveloped country. Absolutely. And she was specifically talking about COVID deaths in Africa. Yeah. Um, Valerie Brancato, what is the current RO or r not of COVID well, the current R not boy Valerie has done her homework. I got to give her a yes, tip. Of, man, she's scaring me. I'll tell you. Uh, <laughs> um, well, the current R not is between two and three, and that is that the the R not is the rate at which uh, how if I'm infected with COVID, how many people on average will I infect? Uh, the and the average is somewhere between two or three. However, there's a lot of variation. We know that there are these so-called super spreaders that might infect dozens and dozens of people, whereas 80% of the people may not affect anybody at all. Uh, We do know that from one of the vaccine trials that not only are you protected uh, against the virus, but the chances that you would ever catch it without symptoms and spread it to other people is also greatly diminished. That's that so-called Astra, I, I'm sorry, it's either the Johnson & Johnson or AstraZeneca, where they also had the volunteers swab their noses once a week to see how often virus was lurking around without symptoms. And they found that the people getting vaccine not only were protected from infection, but also protected from picking it up and shedding it to other people, which was a really big finding. Absolutely. So it looks like our last question is, after receiving the vaccine, when will folks be allowed to travel? And are there any precautions that we, would, we should take as we travel? Yeah, the, the issues on any kind of activity, what we get to do here in Massachusetts, whether we get to travel, uh, are really political decisions that are typically made by public health authorities based on how much virus is around. Uh, and it's not as if you, once you hit a magic number of vaccinated individuals, uh, you can go ahead and go wherever you want. Also, it's 
safe to say that different countries are going to set their own policies and they may or may not make sense. Like, you know, our friend Senator Ted Cruz was in the news and uh, he decided to hop a plane to Mexico in the middle of the Texas uh, <laughs> uh, deep freeze. Uh, and one of the reasons was that Mexico doesn't require a quarantine when you get there, even though the virus is raging there. It's crazy. Uh, and so they have I mean, the absence of a quarantine there strikes me as crazy. On the other hand, many of the European countries are behind the United States in terms of getting people vaccinated, and they have fairly strict quarantines. And so, you know, it wouldn't be much of a vacation to go to, you know, I don't know, England or something and have to sit in a hotel room on quarantine for two weeks before you could do anything. Right. So I, th I think it's really going to be more about how disease burden and how many new cases we're seeing. Mm -hmm. I do think that come the uh, early summer, because of the rate we're at going now, which is a combination of lots of people getting vaccinated, a lot of people who have been infected, whether they know it or not, and they have immunity, and more and more people knowing someone who's gotten the virus and therefore taking those precautions like masking seriously, we're seeing rates of virus fall that are just amazing. I mean, we were seeing 250,000 new cases every day back around the new year. And now it's in the 50 to 60,000 range. So it's come down by a factor of five, which is amazing. And if it keeps up at that rate, we'll be at a pretty low level. Any of you who look at that uh, map of Massachusetts where they had the red, green, and yellow shading of the towns. Uh, the, pretty much the whole state was red back around Christmas time, and now there's more yellow than red. So we're clearly heading in the right direction. You know, I want to thank you for being here with us, Dr. Kerouac, and I invite you to just give us, you know, your last wrap-up thoughts, little takeaways that you think uh, are most important as a result of this talk tonight. Well, first of all, I want to thank you all for, you know, being public health warriors in your own right and taking the message out there to your friends and family and people that you influence. Uh, that's the only way we're going to defeat this virus is to get uh, fact-based encouragement out there. And people want to hear that from a trusted voice. Uh, and so I really thank you for, for the efforts that you all are putting forward. I would say we've got this virus on the run now. And it's a great time, but we don't want to let up on the gas. We have to continue to follow the public health measures. We have to try to get everybody vaccinated uh, because this is still not something you want to fool around with. And I think that's particularly true in the African-American community. So uh, I still think we have our work cut out for us, but I really like the trend that we're on right now. All right. Thank you. So I'm going to hand it back over to Madam President Kimberly. Um, I'm going to give you the reins. So that was awesome. I feel that everyone should have walked away with some more information to be able to make an informed decision. And I appreciate everything that you said and you brought to us. I'm so thankful that you agreed to come and talk with us, Dr. Kerouac. <laughs> we had some um, sores that were pulling and um, wanted to let me know that it was okay. You were more than willing to come and speak with us. So we are just thankful that you came. It was um, my honor. Thank you, Reverend Strother. It really is. Thank you. So we are going to turn it over at this time to the chairs of the committee so that they can give out their thank yous. And then I know that we have a couple of baskets um, and things that we want to raffle off, but thank everyone for attending and look out for more information and we'll get it out to the community. Okay, thanks everybody, bye-bye. Well, thank you everyone for joining us, um, those near and far. I hope this information was helpful. Um, I hope it will help you make a, an informed decision. Um, and we're just grateful that you all took the time. I know everyone has a busy schedule, um, even though we're home. Um, I just appreciate that you all made an effort to join us and I hope you, um, are able to share some of this information with some of your friends and family. So thank you all. I took the liberty of taking everyone who registered for the event and putting their name in a wheel. So okay. um, I'll go ahead and spin the wheel and then we'll notify the winner. And again, we do have a COVID-19 basket that we're giving away. Um, let's see what happens. 
We had over 161 people register for this event. So let's see who is the lucky winner. Miss Christine Wolverson. So Christine, this is what your basket's gonna look like. So we'll get your information and we will make sure it's delivered to you. Congratulations. So thank everyone for attending and we'll see you at our next event. Have a great afternoon. Thank you, everyone.